For the empty case, we have an example that tells us the answer should be empty. For the counts case, let's look at what the template gives us. The template gives us the first and the reverse of the rest. If the list is man by its dog, then the first is man, and the reverse of the rest is the reverse of bytes dog, so it's dog bytes. If we have man and dog bytes, and we want to get dog bytes man, that means we want to add man to the end of dog bytes. This is a good time to apply the wishlist method. The wishlist method says, why don't we hope for a function called, let's say, add to end that will give us the right result when the first element of the list, which is man, and the reverse of the rest of the list, which is dog bytes, are given to this new function. So we have these examples for the new function called add to end. To write this function again, we follow the list processing template. For the empty case, we have to ask, what does it mean to add some element like dog to the end of the empty list? We should get a single element list. When the input list is not empty. Again, let's look at what the template gives us. The template gives us the first of the list, which in this case is dog. The template also gives us the result of adding man to the end of the rest of the list. The list is dog bytes, so the rest of the list is just bytes. Let's write an example for what should happen. If we add man to the end of this rest of the list, then we should get bytes man. So the question is, given dog and bytes man, how do we get dog bytes man? The answer is just cons. We finished designing both the rev function and its helper function add to end that the wishlist method causes us to write. Let's test our code though. All right, now it turns out that this rev function is not as efficient as it could be. To see why, let's try to apply rev to a long list to see how long it takes. This is trickier than you might think because when you just write a long list and give it to rev and watch the result come back, most of the time that the computer spends is not on reversing the list, but on printing the reverse of the list that it shows you. So we need some way to reverse the list without the computer showing us the result. Let's first work on building a long list. There's a built-in list abstraction that's useful here. You've used it a little bit before. It's called build list. It takes a length of the list and then a function that would turn any number like 0, 1, 2 through 19 into the element of the list. So for example, if we just want a list of numbers from 0 to 19, I could just pass the function that takes anything to itself to build list. That's not very long, but let's just test out how we time things. If we reverse this list, we get this also 20 element list, but we don't want to see the list. So instead, let's, let's say, measure the length of the list. Now we only see the length, which is much shorter, and this is a fine way to measure how long it takes to reverse the list without spending all our time printing the reverse of the list. Now, another thing that you might find handy is there's actually this operation called time that would not just run the program, but also show us how long it takes. So we want to look at the real time in the middle here, and that measures how long it took to reverse the list and then measure its length, but not print out the result. Again, because 20 is not a very long list, this is taking no time. But what if we say use 2,000 elements in the list? 
now is taking 3,000 milliseconds. So that's three seconds. And if we make the list even longer, like 20,000 elements, then it takes 341 seconds. That's a long time. Now, there's actually a building function that does the same thing as rev. It's called reverse. If we use reverse, it takes no time. How does reverse do it so fast? We're going to see that later in this lecture. But first, let's talk about something completely different. Let's talk about trains. I like trains. Here's a subway map of the Boston area. There's a red line train that departs from Ashmont Station and stops at Shawmut, Fields Corner, where I lived for a while, Savin Hill, JFK UMass, Andrew, Broadway, and beyond. Now, because this map is not drawn to scale, looking at it, you wouldn't know that the distance from Fields Corner to Savin Hill is much farther than the distance from Savin Hill to JFK UMass. To learn about those distances, we can look at this table published by the government. This table says that the distance from Fields Corner to Savin Hill is one mile, whereas the distance from Savin Hill to JFK UMass is only 0.71 miles. But what if we want to know not the distance from each station to the next, but the distance from the starting point of the train, Ashmont, to each station? That's what the next column is for. It says that the distance from Ashmont to Fields Corner is 1.2 miles. It's handy to have both of these columns in the table, but we actually only need one of them because we can compute them from each other. For example, we can compute the distance from Ashmont to Savin Hill by adding the distance from Ashmont to Fields Corner and the distance from Fields Corner to Savin Hill. Let's design a function to compute the second column, the cumulative distances, from the first column, the distances between stations.